Hello and welcome to the National Organic Program Update Webinar by Miles McAvoy, hosted by eOrganic. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the Webinar Coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the Organic Agriculture Community of Practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. We are very pleased to have the opportunity to host Miles McAvoy as our guest speaker today. Miles currently serves as the Deputy Administrator of the USDA National Organic Program. Prior to coming to the USDA, he led the Organic Certification Program at the Washington State Department of Agriculture, and he has been working in the field of organic agriculture for more than two decades. Well, good afternoon or good morning, depending upon where you are. Um, I'm going to give a, a basic overview of uh, the National Organic Program and some of the activities that we're you did. doing, the certification process and the standards. And as the presentation proceeds, we'll get more and more into the specific uh, issues that the program is currently dealing with. And uh, so it gets more and more uh, in-depth as we go through the presentation today. So first of all, let's just start, why organic? Why is organic in important? Uh, there's a lot of great reasons to support organic agriculture, environmentally sound farming system, biodiversity that you uh, see on organic farms is really important, uh, animal welfare components of the organic standards. Uh, organic farmers are using uh, very minimal synthetic inputs and toxic uh, pesticides in their production. And then the part that uh, is very exciting to me is uh, rural development and economic opportunity. There's so many opportunities in organic marketing for new and beginning farmers uh, to revitalize uh, uh, the rural landscape with uh, job creation. Uh, there's currently over 500,000 people involved in organic agriculture in the U.S. and it's very exciting to see the growth and opportunities that exist. So one of the stories that uh, to put a, a face on the uh, organic agriculture and the opportunities that I'd like to tell is the v Veterans Sustainable Agricultural Training Program, which is based outside of San Diego. And uh, this is a program where uh, a military vet uh, served two tours of duty in Iraq, came back and wanted to give back to the military community uh, and was noting that a lot of veterans were having trouble transitioning back to uh, civilian life. And, and saw that uh, there's so many opportunities in farming uh, and it's very healing for a lot of vets to get involved with, uh, with farming that he created this Veteran Sustainable Agricultural Training Program with his wife uh, who's uh, here in the picture here. So it teaches uh, veterans how to grow organic hydroponic crops from seed to market. That's kind of the specific uh, mechanism that they use, but it's all about business planning, financial management, uh, learning about the food industry. So a lot of the veterans that go through this program create their own business. One in particular uh, is, um, is this gentleman here who was homeless for two years, living in the bush in San Diego, and went through the Veteran Sustainable Agriculture Training Program and uh, created a new business, this hot sauce called Dang, uh, and it's available in local grocery stores. So it's just a great story of some success for some people that were transitioning back to civilian life and uh, the opportunities that exist in organic farming and organic food production. So to briefly go over the history of organic, um, before 1990 there was no national organic standards. Uh, there were different state standards and private standards and the Congress stepped in, saw that diversity of standards and uh, passed the Organic Food Production Act as part of the 1990 Farm Bill, which was the foundation for developing the USDA organic regulations. USDA at the time was not really thrilled by um, taking on USDA organic standards, but over a period of time they've grown to really uh, gra grasp and embrace organic agriculture and now it's very much an integral part of the services that USDA provides to support organic agriculture around the country. So it took a while from the passage of the Organic Food Production Act to the uh, implementation of the USDA organic regulations which became fully effective in 2002. And so now uh, a little more than 10 years later 
Uh, we continue to, to support the organic industry, uh, both local, uh, regional, and international marketing of organic food products, protecting organic integrity from farm to market, uh, and expanding the scope of organic agriculture throughout USDA. So it's not just a program within the National Organic Program, but there are many other USDA agencies that are supporting uh, the organic industry. So specifically certification is a key part of organic agriculture and the question why is certification important? Um, you can't tell an organic apple from a non-organic apple just by looking at it. It all has to be uh, the, the way that the product is grown and, and produced and identified from farm to market. So the USDA organic seal uh, and the organic claim allows people to identify organic products. It empowers the consumers to choose between production methods. Uh, it's also a gateway to certain USDA services. So organic operations have um, access to uh, uh, certification co cost share, uh, to some um, crop insurance programs, and to some equip programs as well. It verifies that products meet the National Organic Standards. First and foremost, it protects consumers to make sure that when they buy organic, they can be assured that it is produced uh, and handled under the standards. And then it also protects farmers, processors, and marketers so that they all have a level playing field and everybody's playing by the same set of rules. So what can be certified? Many different things with standards for crops, which include uh, many different things like wheat, cotton, uh, pasture can be certified organic. Uh, wild crops can be certified organic, including wild harvested mushrooms, uh, kelp, and wild berries. Uh, livestock, including beef, eggs, and milk, and poultry. And then processed or multi-ingredient products like juice and soup and bread and yogurt. All these things are different types of products that could be certified organic under the USDA organic regulations. So organic certification ensures that products were produced without prohibited substances or methods. So for instance, GM, GMOs are prohibited. Uh, the use of GMOs are prohibited in organic production. Arsenic, uh, synthetic fertilizers are prohibited. Uh, most synthetic pesticides are prohibited. Natural substances are allowed unless they're specifically prohibited. And synthetic substances are prohibited unless they're specifically allowed. So for the most part, uh, most natural substances are allowed and there are very few synthetic substances that are allowed in organic production either for in crops, livestock, or handling. The standards are scale neutral. All operations must meet the same requirements whether they're uh, small and selling into local markets or uh, involved in international trade. So first question that a farmer is going to have is, uh, is the land eligible for uh, certification for organic status? Uh, the standards require at least a three-year transition between the use of a prohibited substance and the harvest of an organic crop. And before that three-year period is over and before the certification is completed, the farm could not use the USDA organic seal or sell, label, or re represent their products as organic. Now there are situations where a non-certified organic operation uh, may have a pasture that no prohibited substances were applied to for three years. If they have adequate records to show that, they could uh, obtain certification um, that first year without that three-year waiting period if, they can, if there's no prohibited substances that have been applied for that three years. Uh, there is some technical and financial assistance available. The Natural Resource Conservation Service has the Environmental Quality Incentives Program that's open to both organic and transitioning farmers for some specific uh, assistance on uh, cost sharing for uh, developing uh, options for organic production. So in terms of the organic requirements, there are specific requirements for each certification category for crops, livestock, wild crops, and processing. There's specific labeling requirements and record keeping requirements. I'm not going to get into the specific requirements during this presentation. Uh, if that's something that uh, e Organic thinks it would be a useful presentation, we could cover the, the standards in some detail at a different time, but we really don't have enough time to get into the specific standards in any depth. Um, violators that do, are not uh, following the standards and label or sell or represent products as organic are potentially subject to uh, enforcement actions, including the loss of certification and also financial pe penalties. We've done a, a number of 
civil penalties over the last couple of years for people uh, labeling products, selling products as organic without certification. So there are penalties that are involved for violating the rules. How much does certification cost? This is a question that we get quite a bit. Uh, it all depends on the size and scope of the operation and which certification agency is doing the certification. It varies between a few hundred to several thousand dollars depending upon the size and scope of the operation. Um, in general, where there's state certification available, those programs tend to have slightly lower fees than the, uh, the private programs. Um, and there are annual recertification costs. If you had to give a, an average, you could say it's about $1,000 per year as an average cost of certification uh, for a, an average size uh, farm or operation. There is the organic certification cost share program that used to be available in all 50 states. Uh, now it's only available in 16 states that are listed on the slide there. They're mostly in the northeast with a couple of western states. Uh, so the National Organic Certification Cost Share program has not been um, refunded, so that program is no longer available in many states. But in those 16 states, financial assistance is available, open to certified organic farmers and handlers, reimburses up to 75% of the organic certification costs up to $750 a year. And for more information about that, you would contact the State Department of Agriculture in those particular states. So who certifies the farms and businesses? These are third-party certification agencies. They're not, uh, USDA does not do certification. We oversee the certifiers. We accredit the certifying agents, but we do not, uh, we do, not do certification. So these are independent certifying agents that could be a government agency like a State Department of Agriculture, or uh, as is more common, a non-governmental uh, accredited certifying agents. So it all depends on what part of the country you're in, uh, what kind of certifiers are available to uh, provide certification services. They all have to follow the same requirements, uh, whether they're a state or a private entity. So basically the certification process uh, for a uh, farm or handler is that they need to submit an application to the certifying agent. The certifying agent is up to them to decide which certifying agent they want to work with. That application would include a description of the operation that's uh, described in the organic system plan, which uh, goes into some detail about the operation in terms of the seeds that are used, the soil fertility, the pest management practices, crop rotation, if it's a livestock operation, where the animals came from, the kind of feed that's fed to the livestock, animal welfare practices uh, for ruminant animals have to include a pasture plan of how the, uh, the ruminants are provided, uh, basically a pasture-based production system. For handlers, they have to provide information on labeling, um, uh, the composition, the ingredients of the products that they're producing, uh, practices of a description of the product from receiving through uh, shipping and the processes that occur during that process between receiving and shipping, uh, practices to prevent commingling uh, or contamination during the handling of the product. So there's specific things that need to be in that organic system plan. Uh, that is part of the whole application that goes into the certifying agent to describe uh, what the organic producer or organic handler is planning to do under the organic requirements. So that comes in, the certifying agent then reviews all that information to determine uh, whether the operation has the ability to comply with the requirements and if it does then a qualified organic inspector is sent out to the operation, conducts an inspection, looks at all the various elements of the operation, uh, seeds, crop production, harvest, audits the records, writes up a report, sends it back to the certifying agent. The certifying agent reviews the report and the organic system plan and if everything is in order and compliant with the USDA organic regulations then a organic certificate is issued. Once that certificate is issued then there's an annual certification renewal process where the uh, the farm or the processor needs to update their organic system plan on an annual basis, pay their annual fees, get reinspected to keep that certification in good standing. That's a very 
quick overview of the certification process. So uh, there are some exemptions or exclusions of operations that do not, they are not required to be certified. So very small organic farms and businesses are not required to be certified if they gross uh, less than $5,000 per year from organic sales, then they're not required to be certified. They're exempt. They still need to follow the standards, but they're not required to go through the certification process. And then some brokers and distributors and traders are excluded from being required to be certified if they're handling product that it remains in the same container uh, that's not relabeled or repackaged, then they're not required to be certified, but most distributors and traders, if they're repackaging or relabeling, then they would need to uh, obtain certification. And then retail food establishments are also not required to be certified under the USDA organic regulations. And again, these operations still must uh, require, uh, uh, comply with specific requirements, but they're not required to be certified. Okay, so just to pull this all together, have an example here for organic cheddar cheese. So first of all, the cows would have to be certified organic cows, meaning that the, um, in general, uh, we're not going to get too into the specifics here, but in general, the cows would be organically managed from the last third of gestation. Next, those cows would not be able to have any added growth hormones. Uh, no antibiotics are allowed in organic livestock production. They would have to be fed on 100% organic feed, so all the agricultural feed and forage that the cows are eating has, has to be organically produced. Um, if they are treated with any prohibited uh, medication, um, if they get sick, they have to be treated. And, are, and, they, and they're treated with a prohibited uh, treatment, then they're no longer organic and it would have to be removed from the organic herd. Uh, they have to graze at least 120 days a year, so uh, it's a pasture-based system for organic ruminant livestock. So during the grazing season, which has to be at least 120 days, the cows have to be on pasture and get at least 30% of their dry matter intake from pasture and the pasture has to be certified organic and it has to the operation has to address animal welfare elements uh, as well. So that's the farm side. So they're inspected every year, their certification is renewed every year, their organic system plan has to address uh, pasture management, animal health, and water and soil management. So those are all components that are covered by the organic system plan, inspected by the organic inspector, and part of the certification process. So the next step is the milk then gets transported to a processor. That organic milk would have to go into a clean truck that uh, met the requirements, was uh, not rinsed with any prohibited substances. It arrives at the certified organic processing facility. Uh, rennet would be added, and rennet is an example of an allowed non-agricultural substance. So there are some non-agricultural substances that are allowed in processed organic food products and rennet in particular is allowed as a type of an animal enzyme uh, that's non-organic but allowed in organic food products. So the cheese processing facility also has to be certified. It has to be inspected every year. That uh, certification is renewed every year. The organic system plan at a cheese processing facility would address things like equipment cleaning, ingredient sourcing to ensure that all the uh, agricultural ingredients met the organic standards and that there was identity and uh, no co-mingling during the handling of organic product uh, so that if they were producing also non-organic cheese, there was no co-mingling that was occurring in the operation. So that would be covered in the organic system plan and inspected by the inspector to ensure that uh, commingling was not occurring. So that's a quick overview of the certification process. Now I'm going to move on to uh, the, the organic program itself, the National Organic Program. So after 10 years of uh, the USDA National Organic Program, there are currently 85 accredited certifying agents. Uh, about 50 of those are domestic certifying agents and the rest of those are foreign certifying agents that are operating in other countries for 
certifying to the National Organic Program and shipping products from those uh, foreign countries into the United States. There are about 25,000 certified organic operations across 133 countries. Uh, $31 billion in U.S. organic sales in 2011. So it's a, a quite a large industry. That's a, a lot of product, a lot of sales. And tens of thousands of inspections, reviews, and certification decisions that are being made by these certifying agents. So the USDA National Organic Program is a, a very small program with a, a $7 million budget, 32 staff. So we're certainly not doing all that work. Our job is to accredit and oversee the certifying agents to make sure that the certifying agents are properly doing the uh, verification and oversight of the organic producers and handlers and properly making the, uh, the calls on what's organic and what's not. So the framework of the National Organic Program is first of all the USDA organic regulations which are uh, uh, aligned with the Organic Food Production Act. As I said, accreditation and oversight of certifying agents to ensure that they're properly doing their job. Uh, ensuring that the certification is done properly, that the inspections, the sampling and auditing are done uh, properly. We provide training and oversight to the certifiers to ensure that they're doing that in a consistent fashion. Uh, we have a uh, program handbook that is specifically uh, provides instructions to certifiers on how to uh, conduct many of their activities. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there's the compliance and enforcement component. So there's a part of uh, the National Organic Program that handles complaints, conducts investigations, and uh, issues civil penalties as needed for violations of the standards. So this structure of the National Organic Program, there's the Office of the Deputy Administrator for overall administration and management of the program. We work very closely with the National Organic Standards Board. And then we have three divisions. The standards division is responsible for developing uh, rules and instructions and guidance. Accreditation and international activities is responsible for overseeing the certifying agents, conducting the audits, and overseeing our international agreements. And then we have the compliance and enforcement division that does the inspections and enforces the standards. So a little more specific about each of those separate divisions. The standards division does rulemaking, including the practice standards in the national list of allowed and prohibited substances, the NOP program handbook, which includes instructions and guidance, and the national list of allowed and prohibited materials, um, working with the National Organic Standards Board with the uh, petition process and developing technical reports for the board to use in their review of substances. And then all substances that are on the national list are re-reviewed by the National Organic Standards Board during the sunset process, which happens once every five years for each substance. And then we also, uh, through the Standards Division, provide interpretations to the organic regulations to provide consistency to certifiers and certified operations. The Accreditation International Activities uh, Division is responsible for about 85 certifiers, 25,000 certified organic operations. They also are responsible for one state organic program, which is the state of California, which operates a uh, registration and uh, conducts enforcement in the state of California. So it's a, um, a component of the National Organic Program that is operated through the California Department of Food and Agriculture in California. So they provide great assistance in terms of oversight and verification and uh, compliance in the state of California. We also have recognition agreements with four countries, India, New Zealand, Israel, and Japan. Uh, this allows us to recognize the accreditation systems in those countries and those governments then do the accreditation and auditing of the certifiers that are certifying to the National Organic Program in those four countries. We have two equivalency arrangements, one with Canada and one with the European Union, which we entered into last year. And an equivalency arrangement means that we accept in totality um, the organic systems in, in Canada and the European Union, uh, meaning their accreditation system, their standards, their certification process, and their compliance and enforcement work. Uh, so that's uh, different than recognition. In equivalency, we accept their standards as well as their certification and accreditation. And then we have export arrangements with Japan and Taiwan to um, that where they recognize the USDA National Organic Standards for organic exports to those particular countries. There's particular requirements uh, 
for those exports uh, that are handled by this Accreditation and International Activities Division. Moving on to the Compliance and Enforcement Division, uh, they ensure consi consistent application of the regulations. They handle complaints, investigations, civil penalties. There's a penalty matrix that they uh, implement. They also handle reinstatements of suspended operations and handle appeals um, and hearings and ensure that there's due process for any adverse actions that are taken by certifiers or by the program. Okay, and then uh, finally the National Organic Standards Board, which is a federal advisory committee board. They have two meetings per year. They develop proposals from their subcommittees. Uh, lots of public comment comes in on those proposals and then they issue final recommendations. Uh, their primary responsibility is on the national list, making recommendations concerning the national list. The USDA cannot add any substances to the national list unless the National Organic Standards Board has made a recommendation to add those substances to the national list, but they also make recommendations on other parts of the organic standards. They, the members of the board uh, are volunteers. They serve five-year terms. There are four organic producers, three environmentalists, three consumer or public interest representatives, uh, two organic handlers, one retailer, one scientist, and one certifier that sit on the board. Okay, I'm going to now move into um, some of the specific activities that we're uh, up to this year. For 2012, we had two uh, NOSB meetings, one in New Mexico and Rhode Island. We did an, a lot of rulemaking. Uh, we had the final residue rule that was published in November and implemented this year. Uh, we've had many national list rulemaking documents that have done and some new policy documents. For compliance and enforcement, we doubled the case closure rate and dealt with some very complex cases. And then we also conducted uh, audits of about cert, uh, 50 certifiers. We have some new audit checklists and we've streamlined our audit review and response to corrective actions. Uh, also, we had an Office of Inspector General audit of the program to look at our oversight of the national list and the uh, appointments to the National Organic Standards Board. They issued a no findings report, which is not very common for the Office of Inspector General. They found no findings for, and uh, concluded that we had very good oversight over the national list and uh, the appointment process for the National Organic Standard Board members. We also entered into a new equivalency arrangement with the EU. And then we reimburse thousands of producers and handlers through the uh, cost share programs. We also continue to communicate through our organic literacy initi initiative, the NOP Organic Insider, and also a newsletter that we call the Organic Integrity Quarterly. Okay, I'm going to talk about some of the specific challenges that we have as a program. First of all, geographic specific. Unmuted. Miles, we lost your sound for a moment. I don't know if you can hear us, um, but if so, um, we lost your sound. I don't know if you're accidentally muted yourself or um, whether or not you can just unplug and plug in your headset if you hear me. Um, if everybody can just bear with us for a moment, we'll try to get Miles back. Um, he is still connected to, oh, he just lost his connection. So um, let's just hang on a minute and let's hope that he comes back soon. Oh yeah, I see him. Okay, I do hear you, Miles. Thanks. I think it was your headset. Something went off. So if you could just backtrack to the beginning of this slide, then everybody can hear you again. So thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Yep, very well. Thanks. Okay, good. Okay, so um, just talking about the number of certified organic you did. around the country. Uh, the point here is that in the south in particular there are not as many certified organic operations. We know that the organic market is strong in the south. There's lots of opportunity there so we want to see how we can expand the opportunities in organic agriculture to all parts of the country uh, beyond where uh, it is today. So the next, uh, let's see, I think I also lost my control. Here we go. Um, the other thing that we've determined through the audits that we do of certifying agents is that the standards are not always applied uniformly. So we continue to work with uh, training and information to certifying agents to ensure that there's more consistency in how the standards are being implemented. 
a lack of data. Uh, there's, there's really not a lot of information in terms of organic production and sales. We're really uh, stymied by that at times. We really need more information about organic agriculture. Insufficient technology is something that's uh, lacking, and then limited funding. Um, we have a very modest program, and so limited resources for doing a lot of the work that we're doing. So we have four initiatives uh, that we developed based on those challenges, clear standards, consumer protection, market access, and information technology. So starting with clear standards, we think this is important in terms of fairness and transparency. And so the activities that we're doing to uh, level that playing field is to publish clear standards, address the gray areas, continue to collaborate with the National Organic Standards Board, and increase transparency. So clear standards, if producers and handlers understand what the standards are, and, uh, then it's much more likely that they'll be able to comply and participate in organic uh, production and handling. Secondly, market access, which leads to economic, economic opportunity. We want to increase organic agriculture in the U.S. We see this, uh, this market access is not just about export markets, but it's also uh, market access to local and regional connections. We want to promote USDA technical and financial assistance to organic producers. Uh, Part of this is also providing access to additional foreign markets and ensuring uniform application of standards. Uh, and I'm going to talk more about our initiatives on uh, enhancing local and regional connections in our Sound and Sensible initiative in a few minutes here. Our next area is consumer protection, which leads to consumer confidence. Uh, this is really first and foremost our mission of, of the National Organic Program is to protect the integrity of organic products. So continuing to do our rigorous investigations, conducting more audits, ensuring that certifiers are consistently implementing the requirements. We want to initiate a market surveillance program uh, and uh, enhance our enforcement actions and ensure that the terms of our trade partnerships are being met. Um, information technology uh, leading to organic integrity. We want to build a better uh, uh, information technology, a list of certified organic operations, uh, make sure that that's a, uh, a uh, real-time database of uh, organic information, provide both historic and current information on the certification status. The concept is that we'd be able to display search results in a list or map-based format so people can have information about where the organic farms and handlers are available um, and allow certifying agents to efficient, efficiently submit updates. So these four areas of uh, clear standards, consumer protection, market access, and information technology will help to level the playing field, protect organic t integrity, increase the number of organic farms and businesses, and connect the organic community via, via this integrity database. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, we're about to begin our question and answer session. So for um, we had a couple of questions um, related to the um, dairy example that you provided um, about the cheddar cheese. So um, let's see if we can go back to those here. Yeah, um, once a dairy cow is treated with an antibiotic, is she never in her lifetime able to produce milk that will be labeled organic? You could talk about that. We've had a few questions coming in about that. Yeah, once a, um, an animal has been treated with a prohibited substance, then it, it has to be removed from the organic, uh, organic string and could not re-enter the herd. That's correct. Okay. And one more about cows. Um, shouldn't cows be managed organically from birth, or is it only during a herd transition that you can have cattle that are managed in the last third of gestation? Yeah, so this is one of the proposed rules that we're hoping to get out later this year. So there's actually uh, two ways that an, a dairy animal can get into organic production. For a, uh, for a new operation, they can bring, uh, they can transition cows uh, using 100% organic feed and, or, and organic practices for 12 months before the production of organic milk. Um, and if they transition to organic production by bringing those animals through that one year transitional period of using organic practices, they could continue to bring in animals um, following organic practices for one year prior to milk production. Other operations uh, that have come into 
organic certification um, need to use uh, all the replacement animals have to be organic from the last third of gestation. So the animals are organic. The, the mother cow has to be organic. Uh, no prohibited substances, 100% organic feed from the last third of gestation. And then her calf has to be raised organically and then can be in the organic herd. So what we're doing in the proposed rule is to clarify um, and follow the recommendations from the National Organic Standards Board to eliminate, the, eliminate that two-track system so that there's only one system for bringing uh, organic dairy stock into organic production. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, here's a couple I of hope I clarified that. That's, <laughs> a, so. that's a difficult okay. topic. Um, the, um, the, we have a few questions and comments about the um, record keeping streamlining you were discussing. Um, this um, listener said that she's been certified organic for 13 years and she's seen the paperwork burden increase every year for dairy operations. And um, so she was wondering if the NOP is able to assist certifiers to reduce the paperwork burden while getting the verification they require. Yeah, that's what we're looking at. Uh, we do understand that the paperwork burden for dairy operations increased significantly with the publication of the pasture rule, which came into full implementation in 2011. So what what the organic community was experiencing were a lot of complaints about operations, uh, organic operations that were not pasture-based, that were not grazing their animals. And so through a period of time with lots of public input, it came up with the agreement that there should be this requirement that during the grazing season that the uh, organic ruminant livestock had to receive a significant portion of their feed from grazing. So that specific requirement is that 30% of their dry matter intake has to come from pasture during uh, the grazing season. And in order for that to be verified, there's a lot of additional uh, records that need to be maintained to verify that that particular requirement of 30% dry matter intake. Yes, the, so there is additional uh, record keeping that's required to meet that new uh, pasture rule. And that's one of the things that we specifically need to look at of how do we uh, make those requirements reasonable while still protecting the integrity to ensure that all operations are, uh, or all organic operations are pasture based. Okay, um, here's a question. Um, if you could um, talk about the status of Chilean nitrate. Yeah, uh, sodium nitrate uh, is a natural substance and uh, has been on the national list of prohibited non synthetics or prohibited non. Um, prohibited naturals since the beginning of the uh, beginning of the National Organic Program. So uh, it was on the prohibited list, but it had an annotation that allowed uh, operations to use sodium nitrate up for up to 20% of their total nitrogen input. So even though it was on the prohibited list, there was still an allowance to use some sodium nitrate for uh, for the nitrogen needs of the crop. In a few years ago, the National Organic Standards Board made a recommendation during the sunset process to uh, remove sodium nitrate from an allowed material and, and make it prohibited. So remove that allowance for 20% sodium nitrate was their recommendation. So what would occur is a change in the annotation on the national list. So this is a natural substance that um, was prohibited with an allowance and so the change to the national list was to get rid of that annotation and just to have it listed as a prohibited natural substance. Uh, during the rulemaking process, uh, well, the, we've had some delay in terms of getting the proposed rule out on that because any change to the national list has to go through a proposed and final rulemaking with uh, public comment. So we've had a delay in getting a proposed rule out on sodium nitrate. So sodium nitrate is now, um, because of sunset, no longer on the national list of prohibited substances. And so there's no longer a specific regulatory restriction on sodium nitrate. 
So as a natural substance, it can be used in organic production in the U.S. under the U.S. National Organic Standards. Um, we have sent out a memo to certifying agents and to organic producers that um, any use of sodium nitrate above that 20% restriction would potentially uh, impact other parts of the organic um, regulations that require uh, require a, a balanced um, soil management plan. And so we're uh, expecting that most organic producers will still comply with having uh, for only using sodium nitrate for up to 20% of their nitrogen inputs while we're finalizing the rulemaking on this particular topic. We do have a proposed rule that will be coming out later this year that will propose to put sodium nitrate on the prohibited list, removing the annotation, uh, but until that rulemaking process is finalized, there's no specific restriction on the use of sodium nitrate. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any update regarding, oh wait, no, let's see, um, do you anticipate, um, I'll ask that question next, do you anticipate a return of cost share outside of the 16 states that are currently covered? Uh, we don't know what will occur with that. Uh, we're waiting for um, the the next farm bill. There's been an extension of the farm bill, and in that far, in the extension of the farm bill, that did not include the National Organic Certification Cost Share Program. So it's up to uh, Congress to determine uh, what happens with uh, the national program. Okay. Um, is there any update regarding the idea of an organic checkoff program? Uh, not from this office, no. Okay. I think that's an initiative that the Organic Trade Association has uh, been exploring, and I, I understand that they've been doing some listening sessions around the country, um, but that would have to go through Congress as well, and so um, there's nothing coming out of USDA or this office in that regard. Okay. Um, has the NOP been encouraged or concerned regarding the number of violations discovered, and how does that compare with several years ago since it's been growing for 10 years? With the increase in the number of violations? Um, it just says, um, have you been concerned regarding the number of violations discovered? Oh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. No, not really. I, for the vast majority of operations uh, comply with the organic standards. Uh, there's a, a v wide variety of different types of violations. so. Certifiers, well, one of the basic concepts of organic is continuous improvement. There are many uh, requirements that organic producers and handlers have to meet, and so part of that process is, of continuous improvement is the audit process. The inspectors go out, they look at the organic system, they look at what the operation is doing, and sometimes they find minor violations. Those are correctable violations that the operation then needs to improve or correct uh, to stay in compliance. So that's the vast majority of violations that we see uh, in our oversight of certifiers and also when we conduct audits of certifying agents. The audits that we've done of certifying agents shows that uh, of all the uh, criteria that they need to conduct uh, and comply with, that they are 96% compliant full compliance with uh, the accreditation and certification criteria, and that's with over 4,000 um, audit criteria that were checked in 2012. There was 96% compliance by the certifying agents. And I think we see a similar trend with um, organic operations as well, so that the, the types of violations, the vast majority of violations that we see are minor correctable violations. Uh, significant violations are really important and that's uh, we take them very seriously. Last year we helped to put three people in jail for fraudulently uh, representing products as organic. That, well, two had to do with fertilizers where they were spiking fertilizers with synthetic nitrogen. Um, those were long-term investigations but the two gentlemen went to jail for spiking uh, fertilizer with uh, synthetic nitrogen and selling it as our approved organic fertilizer to organic producers and then one gentleman um, went to jail for fraudulently selling uh, feed as organic that was conventional feed. 
So those things are very important and we take those seriously. Now we have a couple of questions about fraud. Um, the first one is how should we handle and report a suspicion of fraud um, when a product is processed outside of the United States? And um, the second question is with the Sound and Sensible initiative, how will reduced record keeping play into research for cases of fraud? So those are two questions then so I can right. repeat if necessary. Well, uh, we have an email address, nopcompliance at usda.gov. Uh, so that's nopcompliance at usda.gov, and we take complaints from all over the world uh, of any violation to the USDA organic regulations. So whether it's domestic or foreign, uh, we get those types of complaints, and those all those complaints are investigated to determine whether or not there's a violation, and when a violation is found, then uh, appropriate enforcement action occurs. Now we have more authority in the US than we have in foreign countries. So for instance, uh, one of the things that we've done the last couple of years is identified some fraudulent certificates. They, they are generally from foreign countries uh, where an, uh, a marketer is trying to sell organic product with a fraudulent certificate. And there we don't have the authority to find a foreign operation. Uh, we'll work with a foreign government if, if that's uh, possible. But our main uh, tactic for those types of fraudulent certificates is to inform the organic community that those certificates are, are fraudulent and we do that through the Organic Insider. So, okay, the second question was about record keeping and sound and sensible. Uh, yeah, how will reduced record keeping play into research for cases of fraud? Right, well, we're not gonna reduce record keeping if it would uh, decrease organic integrity. So our, our first, uh, principle is to maintain organic integrity, but there's a lot of records out there, and what are the key records that are necessary to uh, maintain that integrity? And we know that there are records that certifiers are requiring operations to maintain that don't add any value to protecting organic integrity. Those records that are important for maintaining organic integrity, those will still be required to be maintained. The lack of records, the lack of appropriate records uh, will lead to uh, violations, compliance actions. If it's significant, could lead to suspension or revocation and civil penalties. So we're not gonna reduce record keeping if it's important to maintain organic integrity. What we're trying to do is identify those types of records that do not add value to maintaining organic integrity. Okay. Um, given that certified operations are lacking in the South, is there a specific plan or strategy to address that deficiency and what factors are con contributing to the deficiency? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so far what we've done is identified that uh, there is a lack of certified organic operations or um, not as many certified organic operations in the South. We're looking at ideas, exploring uh, why is that happening and um, it's a difficult a difficult area for our for us to address uh, because of our limited resources, but we are talking to other agencies at USDA to see what can we do to try to build capacity in that region. Okay, here's a question about inspector qualifications. Um, will these be changing in the near future and how can we stay informed on this if um, they are planning to take part in some IOIA trainings this year but don't want to partake in something that will not be acceptable to the NOP in the future? Yeah, um, well the NOP has not uh, published anything specific on the qualifications of organic inspectors or reviewers or certification staff. Uh, we have worked with the Independent Organic Inspectors Association uh, to develop um, qualifications and criteria for uh, organic certification review staff and inspectors and we plan to publish that later this year that would provide that um, that oversight of what or that overview of what we expect in terms of qualifications training and experience for uh, everyone that's involved in the organic certification process um, and that will provide the guidance to certifiers and to inspectors on what we expect um, in that area uh, currently, the organic regulations state that uh, certifiers have to have qualified personnel to do the work that have adequate experience. Uh, we've provided information at training that uh, the experience needs to include uh, education, 
experience um, and what the instructions will do is provide a lot more detail on what those expectations are. So ILIA training we've always uh, supported as one key training program that can be utilized by certifiers and inspectors to learn about organic production, but there's many other things that can also uh, provide that uh, expertise as well. Okay. Um, what do you see as the role of land-grant universities for providing research on cultural practices and guidelines for following the NOP regulations? The role of land-grant universities. Well, uh, some land-grant universities are doing a lot to support organic agriculture and um, so by supporting things like e-organic and workshops uh, working with the organic certifiers that are in the region to provide uh, information about what the organic requirements are. So I think land-grant land -grant universities uh, can do a lot to provide information to the agricultural community about what the requirements are. Um, I think they need to uh, be engaged with um, the certifiers that are active, sometimes it would be the State Department of Agriculture to ensure that the information that's provided to the ag community uh, is aligned with the requirements. But certainly we would encourage uh, land-grant universities to, um, to work with the organic community, agricultural community to provide information about the, the requirements. The Organic Literacy Initiative is a very good resource for land-grant universities to look at for the specifics about the organic requirements. Um, the NOP Organic Insider can keep land-grant universities informed about any changes in those standards or uh, things that are particular interest to um, those land-grant universities. So, yeah, more involvement by land grants would be uh, very welcomed. Okay. Um, could you um, discuss um, whether OMRI is related to the NOP? Mm, that's a very good question. So the Organic Materials Review Institute is a, an independent organization that reviews substances uh, to determine whether they're compliant with the USDA organic regulations. They uh, publish a generic list of allowed crop, livestock, and handling materials. They also provide a product list, which is their main service, uh, that shows which substances, what specific substances, uh, for instance, what BT products or what fertilizers, what uh, soil amendments, what livestock feed supplements comply with the National Organic Standards. So uh, OMRI is accredited under USDA's ISO Guide 65 program. Uh, which is a program that shows that they have a quality management system in place that uh, that meets international standards for a certification agency. And so the National Organic Program does recognize the work that OMRI does and that the decisions that OMRI makes on materials are uh, acceptable to the NOP as a viable way to verify that a substance meets the organic standards. So organic producers, organic handlers, and certifiers can all utilize the OMRI review and list of approved substances and know that those substances comply with the uh, National Organic Standards. The National Organic Standards Board has made a couple of recommendations concerning the review of materials. Um, and one of those recommendations is that the USDA should directly accredit material review organizations such as OMRI. And so we're looking at uh, mechanisms to have even more oversight over the work that OMRI conducts. But at the current time, OMRI is an independent nonprofit organization that we recognize but is not directly accredited by the National Organic Program, though it is accredited by USDA as um, under the ISO Guide 65 program. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, can you address the different standards in Canada and Europe regarding the equivalency program you previously described? For example, um, differing standards regarding antibiotic use in Europe and Canada in animals versus the NOP standards in the U.S. Sure. So. Uh, 
both in Canada and in the EU, there is some allowance for the use of antibiotics in organic livestock production. In the US, there is no allowance whatsoever for antibiotic use in organic livestock production. So in our equivalency agreements with both uh, the EU and Canada, uh, that was what we call a critical variance. So uh, something that was not acceptable and that any product, any livestock product that comes from Canada or the EU uh, needs to be verified that it was not produced with antibiotics. So, um, so we have a broad acceptance of, for instance, the European organic standards and any organic product that's certified under the European organic standards. But for livestock products, that there's an additional requirement that any livestock products that were produced in the EU would have to be verified that they were uh, that no antibiotics have been used in that production. We also have a critical variance uh, going the other way because uh, antibiotics, uh, specifically tetracycline and streptomycin, are allowed in organic crop production, specifically for fire blight control in organic apple and pear production in the U.S. And that's not allowed in um, in the EU. So any organic products that are going from the U.S to the EU, they have, if they include apples and pears, they have to be verified that those apples and organic apples and pears were not produced with the use of tetracycline or streptomycin. Okay, um, let's see. Um, given the 2012 OIG milk audit, what is the proposal to increase the enforcement or detection of GMs in milk? Yeah, the uh, the phase one of the Office of Inspector General milk audit. Uh oh, we lost your sound again, Miles. Um, hang on a second. Um, let's see, your sound has disappeared. I don't know if you can hear me. There you are. Okay. Oh, we disconnected again. I think we'll be able to get him back since we have the last few times. So just wait a moment. Okay, you're back. You there, can Miles? Can you hear me now? Yep, I hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, perfect timing. Uh, GM question and I go off the air. Um, yeah, um, the milk audit did uh, noted that, uh, well, their recommendation or their finding was that um, their, they had questions about the, uh, the oversight, the testing of organic feed to determine that it was not um, produced or wasn't genetically modified feed. So the, um, let's see now. So what we did is we, um, we took a look at that and we um, analyzed the situation and we provided a report to the OIG just a couple of weeks ago that's available on our website that uh, describes the sampling and the GM detection technology that's out there um, that can be utilized by certifying agents to verify that organic feed is not genetically modified. And we also described the guidance that we've provided to certifiers concerning um, residue testing, including testing for uh, prohibited pesticides and other prohibited substances. And so we just uh, submitted that report to the Office of Inspector General uh, just a few weeks ago and that report on, uh, I can't remember the full title of the report, but something like biotech testing methods and sampling methods for organic agriculture is available and describes the guidance that we provide. Uh, we also provided training to the certifiers in January in Orlando, Florida on how to um, conduct testing and analyze results for both pesticides and other prohibited substances. Uh, the real key for a certifier if they find residues of a prohibited substance or residues of GM material is to determine whether or not uh, that substance has been used or whether it's uh, adventitious presence um, or the result of commingling or inadequate buffers. And different tactics are then utilized depending upon why those residues are there. 
So for instance, if, um, if a certifier did testing and found that the feed was 100% GM, then that would indicate that the product was genetically modified. That would be a, um, a significant violation leading to suspension or revocation, possible civil penalties. The other thing that could be determined is that d during testing that there was like 50% GM material. Again, that would not be inadvertent presence. That would indicate that there was a problem with, with commingling and significant contamination that was occurring during the handling of that organic feed. Uh, on the other hand, if you found very low levels of GM material or any prohibited substance, then that would uh, that would mean well, you'd have to you have to do an investigation to determine why those sub that material is there, but that would tend to um, have you s look at things like inadequate buffer zones or inadequate cleaning of equipment, uh, things that are correctable that are important to correct, but uh, don't indicate the use of genetically modified ingredients. So in terms of the OIG milk audit finding, um, we have responded to that, and that report is available on our website. Okay. Um, we are unfortunately running out of time, um, but I'd like to thank everyone for their questions.